Discover how smarter project insights can lead to better project outcomes. Hello, project people. A very warm welcome to everyone to our new podcast, an episode on the Project Chatter podcast. It's great to have you back. Uh, remember to hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast player and YouTube. If you'd like to see our friendly faces, uh, we're back, Dale. It's good to see you, mate. How are you? I'm well, thanks. I'm well. Um, it's a strange time, I think, in the UK. I think I said it on the last episode where we've got this high pressure at the moment and it's keeping mm. the weather mild, but it's not hot and it's not cold. So your warm welcome, I think I, I can I can take the warm welcome. It's not quite cold enough to say it's not warm. So, but you 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 usually look warm anyway, Val. So it's good to see you. Oh, thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I, w- I wouldn't know what the outside looks like. I'm still on the inside, locked up in Australia. So, look, I am envious. The UK has opened its gates, but uh, let's get into this guest today. We have a returning guest, a veteran, if you like, of the podcast, Dr. Dan Patterson. Welcome back to the show, mate. How are you? Gents, I'm very well, and uh, thank you so much for having me on the show again. Excited to oh, uh, spend some time with you. Absolutely, absolutely, and I always struggle because we always get to the, like the hour and a half mark, and we we could go on for longer, couldn't we? We always do, and uh, it's always thrilling to talk to you and about the future because that's my favorite spot. I love to be there; it's enjoyable. Um, but I know we have a fixed amount of time with you, Dan, so I'm going to get straight into it. Let's get into CPM or critical path method. I'm just going to open it up there. So what's your view on critical path method? And then we can go down some rabbit holes from there. Wow, you're not messing about, are you? I thought you were going to ask <laughs> no me way. Uh, how the family Straight are, up. how the weather is. You know, it's 110 <laughs> degrees it. here in Scottsdale, what? Arizona. And yeah. What's, uh, what's, the con- what's the conversion to, what's 110? Is that like 40 degrees? Is that? Is that oh, now, I, now, now as a uh, expat, I'm embarrassed because I've forgotten the uh, Fahrenheit <laughs> uh, Celsius conversion. It's, it's it? got to be very close to... Uh, 40. We're all reaching for our phones now doing the Google uh, conversion. Beautiful. But, uh, that is a, um, that it's, is a good it's uh, let, let me see. It comes back as uh, bloody hot. Yeah. That's awesome. That's so, why you're wearing that awesome shirt. Now, you look very colorful and very warm today. So, yeah, we're jealous, <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, in the UK it is and very hot here. So, anyhow, back to your uh, question. So, um, CPM, so critical path methodology. So, um, you've probably asked me the hardest question. Um, you could possibly have asked me because I've spent my entire professional career ever since I was uh, 22 years old, um, building solutions around CPM and, and scheduling. And, yeah. you know, I think it's, it's, it's fair to say we, we've, we've done a pretty good job of building on the CPM concept. And, and you know, I guess for, for those of you that are less familiar with it, just to break it down into very simple chunks, CPM is a scheduling technique where we're, we're trying to take into account the scope of work and by sequencing those chunks and defining the duration of each of those chunks, we run a, a very simple algorithm, a forwards, backwards pass, and we calculate duration through to the finish of the project. And the technique um, actually came about in the uh, in the mid 50s. So I think we're on you know, the, the seventh decade of this technique. So there's obviously some goodness there and almost without exception, every major CapEx project worldwide to to some varying degree has utilized um, CPM. So do I believe in the, in the basic concept of CPM? Of course I do. Um, Have we made good inroads through improving it? Yes, absolutely. As an industry, I think in the last 20 years, um, you know, I think some of the, the primary uh, accelerators, obviously adding the layer of risk on top of CPM. So instead of you know, standing up and saying, it's going to take us 54 months till completion and we're hundred percent certain, you know, instead now I think we're a bit more realistic and we say, well, there's a, there's an associated confidence level with that 54 month remaining duration or, or project completion. Um, having said all of that, when you look at the track record of CapEx project completion, whether it's looking at uh, project budgets or, or project timelines, um, the track record's pretty pretty darned atrocious. You know, I, I think we're mm. probably in the single digits as a percentage in terms of projects that finish on time. So over the last six months, and um, 
uh, this, this is where we should have done the preamble at the beginning, because I've actually been on sabbatical. And Lovely. I've been sort of taking, yeah, yeah. well, I, I've been, been, it's been like a working sabbatical, but uh, I've been <laughs> doing a bit of sort of looking back and, and looking at less around the successes that we've had around CPM, but more trying to figure out, is there a, is there a better way of forecasting the unknown, looking forward to the end of a, end of a project? And what I'm realizing is when, when, when you, again, when you break down CPM into its sort of rudimentary steps or sequence, it's very linear in nature to the point where, you know, step one is define your scope, then you break down the scope, you create a list of, of WBS elements, you associate durations with each of them, and you link them together with precedence relationships, typically finish to start relationships, right? So task B can't start until task A is finished type of thing all the way through to project, mm. uh, project N. So CPM is incredibly linear by the fact that you're, you're forced to link stuff together. And, and you know, some of you are gonna say, well, actually you're not forced. You're highly encouraged. I mean, you know, today when you run a schedule critique, you're gonna get dinged for not having continuous free flow in logic. So it is absolutely a very linear way of modeling project execution. <clears throat> now, looking forward to execution, I'm not so sure that execution is necessarily as linear as CPM is, is, is driving us towards or is forcing us. Because when it comes to execution, you know, first of all, execution is, is dependent on procurement. Um, so you've got to uh, have the delivery of the materials and then you build the stuff and you go through commissioning to completion. Well, there's, you know, on a, on a typical CapEx project, there is a infinite number of ways or sequence in which you can carry out stuff now, I know you're gonna to say to me, yes, Dan, but you've got to build the foundation before the wall, before the roof, before you do the finishes. Yes, there are some overarching logical constraints, if you like, but I think the, the, this concept of when we're planning, every activity has to have a predecessor and a successor to, to define this linear path, um, I think is a little bit long in the tooth. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm, I've just realized you're recording this and I've just spent the last 20 years developing solutions that look at things like missing predecessors and successes and things like that. But <laughs> that's okay because what we've done yeah. as an industry to date is good. It's really, really good, but we're not at a point where we are, we're, we're perfect by any means. Again, projects continue to be late and, and over budget. So I'm now looking at scheduling and, and forecasting into the future from a modeling perspective, um, with with less linear dependency, if that makes sense. Now, where I've been going with this thought process is, I think as with any concept, when you start off with a project, it's big picture, it's overarching scope. And then mm -hmm. as time goes on, you iteratively dive down into the details. So what if instead of when we, we fire up a, a scheduling tool or we take a blank piece of paper, instead of thinking linearly left to right, what if we think top down and, and start to, to disseminate the project hierarchically? So we start off with a, and I'm just thinking sort of visually here, start off with big box, overarching project scope. And then we break the scope down into perhaps sub deliverables and those sub deliverables become sub sub deliverables. And then at some point, you get down into the work that has to be done. If we start planning top down instead of linearly, then maybe that's a better way of, of planning because when it comes to execution, I don't think we are as, as constrained left to right as perhaps the CPM schedule suggests. Mm. And now I need to take a breath because that was a very long. Uh, yeah, that was, that was fantastic. I just, I just sat back and relaxed and you just went. <laughs> um, I, I was thinking, well, then, you know, you're probably describing, <clears throat> well, in, in my limited view and, and Dale can chime in, uh, the kind of the work breakdown structure, because you, you kind of do start vertical mm -hmm. and then we, and then you're right. We do something. We, we, we want to then horizontal that vertical and again, it does get tricky. And I've always found it interesting what happens to the work breakdown structure. Once you actually start the work, it gets very bastardized because then, yep. um, it's not about chunking down the work. It's not that, that decomposition. It's about um, that cross flow because there are these integrated departments and they are usually left to right. So you have design, then you have build, then you have mm -hmm. install, execute and commission. And 
and there, there's just no way to get out of that rut. Um, and, and that bit then becomes very detailed and you're stuck in it and you're stuck in the CPN method and, and the waterfall approach. Um, we had a guest on, I think it was last episode, uh, Dale, who really rattled our brains about the foundations and fundamentals of project management and made us feel really, really dumb, Dan. And we was talking about, um, um, how this it would work in a structured environment basically was there was the takeaway i got from it in my basic language uh-huh. yeah and and how unstru how most projects are really really chaotic it's not a very structured environment unless you're in a, a very mature space and so my understanding is that cpm can work as you know very well in a vacuum of space or on a very very mature structured organizational project and it just seems to me and and probably the the results of the success of rates of projects that um, a lot of our projects are anything but structured. And the fact that they're getting bigger, not smaller, the fact that they're going across borders now, we've got multiple programs that are just uh, multinational uh, projects with remote people accessing them. It just makes mm-hmm. it all a lot more complex. And so the, the linear spread of project management or CPM just doesn't seem viable, does it? I think we have to evolve. Is that your view as well? Yeah, 100%. So, you know, the, Again, just going back to the mechanics of CPM, you can have a 5,000 line item, uh, well-defined, accurate duration activity schedule, and you can miss one precedence relationship, one logic link, and your schedule can be absolutely, the the forecast date can be absolutely fundamentally flawed. It is so dependent, it's 100% dependent on these damn logic links, which when you get back to execution, in the real world, we're not dependent on the these hard coded links, and so mm. you know I really like your you know you, you started talking off about uh, the analogy to hierarchical WBS structures. What if we if, you know if we took my chunking concept? Um, I need to come up with a more technical name before we go to market with this, but uh, <laughs> the, the hierarchical yeah. chunking concept. You can still look at each of those chunks and say. Are there any physical or procurement or spatial dependencies that need to be satisfied before that chunk can start? If not, that chunk can actually start right at the beginning of the project. Now, if there are dependencies, that will then start to drive the sequence of work because that chunk won't be able to start until the dependencies are satisfied. That will start to build a natural sequence. So where I'm going with this is I think you could actually develop a very realistic, but probably more accelerated or optimized sequence of work through this this hierarchical chunking concept and then simply just interrogating the chunks and asking what are the dependencies and then using that as the basis for doing your sequencing. That would get us away from this mandate of everything must have at least one predecessor and one successor and, and no open ends and blah, 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 blah. That was really done just to satisfy the mathematics. You know, again, when you look at the real world in execution, there isn't there isn't that dependency. What's the first thing that happens in execution if something is delayed? The the foreman or the, the superintendent says, okay, we're gonna resequence the work. Oh, you're yeah. gonna resequence the work? That means actually your linear dependency wasn't actually, it didn't actually exist. Oh yeah, but that was just in the CPM schedule. We can actually <laughs> move some stuff around and we'll, oh really, okay. So actually there yeah. wasn't a dependency. Well, that's a perfect example of the fact that you can resequence, and if you can resequence, you can probably optimize not just during execution. You can probably optimize during the planning phase as well. Yeah, amazing. I, I was thinking so. So Val mentioned <laughs> WBS. I was thinking WBS as well. But what you're describing is something slightly different, I think, Dan. Mm-hmm. And you, you said you know come up with a name, and the thing I came up with was PBS, planning breakdown structure, perhaps. Um, but uh, nice. What I was thinking no, I think, was, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, uh, I'm thinking CBS chunk breakdown structure. There you go. Well, okay. <laughs> CBS for me is cost breakdown structure, but I know, yeah, I know, it, I know. it could work. <laughs> uh, but just getting back to it, I think. So, so going back to when I sort of cut my teeth in the planning world, we used to do a form of, you know, you get the rolling wave planning and you take your WBS and you wouldn't detail plan every single work package you'd have planning packages as we call them. And then as you sort of six months, three months out, you'd start detail planning those. Um, But you'd have these high level logic links and that then allowed you that that bit of agility without having the, you know, 40,000 line schedule from day dot, 
and having to live with this beast and constantly having to to i guess maintain it um but yeah so i guess for for me just gathering my thoughts i'm thinking do we spend enough time considering the wbs before we start planning because it feels like to me a lot of people just go okay there's the wbs let's get into the activities and plan it now it doesn't really matter but if we spent a little bit more time considering how do we actually want to deliver these work packages before we just go okay whether we go by product breakdown or work breakdown and then plan it maybe if we considered up front a little bit more before we got to the planning stage that would help i don't know what your thoughts on that is so you, you've touched on something that is so close to my heart here so wbs work breakdown structure it's incorrectly named it's not a structure of work its formal definition is actually structure of scope and as you roll yeah. scope up you get to the thing that you're building or the service that you're producing so if i'm building a, 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 an offshore platform my my root node is my offshore platform and then i have you know the upper deck and blah 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 that starts to become my work breakdown structure. Well, these are the deliverables. These are the things that we're gonna hand over to the owner as the, as the contractor. It's nothing to do with how we're going to build it. That's the work, that's the activities. So in a perfect or an ideal theor theoretical planning environment, you'd have the scope structure, which is our incorrectly named WBS. And then you have the activities underneath that. And it's yeah. almost as if the activities then have to uh, draw down on the remaining scope. And once you've drawn down on the scope, you've satisfied that punk chunk, chunk of scope, you go on to the next piece. So I've always believed that, again, as an industry, we have, we have failed horribly at properly differentiating between scope and the work that is needed to achieve that scope. And no one's really done this to date properly, but imagine if there was a, a software solution that didn't even allow you to create activities. We've already got that. That's that's Primavera, that's Microsoft Project, that, that's a scheduling yeah. tool, that's worky stuff. What if there was a tool that assisted in these, these scope nuggets, these scope chunks, the, these, these you called it a, a, a PBS, I think. They could still be hierarchical. And to your point, you know, we don't necessarily define each of them at the same level because we don't, you know, all scope isn't, isn't equal at any point in time. Um, but then we can hand over those scope elements and say to the, the, the work planner, okay, now what is needed? What are the resources? What are the, the materials, et cetera, et cetera. You know, again, you know, you look at a traditional CPM scheduling tool, there's this concept of, well, you can assign resources to areas of work. Um, and those resources can be labor, material, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if I'm planning a three-year project, I really don't know how many laborers or, my or apologies. Oh, I couldn't hear. That's my uh, Siri on my phone. <laughs> Talk of technology. Of, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, I realistically cannot forecast how many site personnel I need to assign to a particular task pre-execution. That's just ridiculous. Um, and so I think we should split planning into scope planning. And then as we get closer to execution, we should have the concept of work planning. Now, there is an emerging uh, field of expertise, if you like, called interval planning. And the idea is that you take a, a CPM schedule and then on a rolling wave basis, you know, 60, 90 day look ahead during execution, you peel off the segment of activities for that particular time window and you do your daily planning. Now, again, I think the concept is, is pretty fundamental and I think it's sound, but it still relies on this horribly linear structure, the CPM schedule. So when you take your, your 90 day sliver of CPM activities, there's no consideration when you're doing your interval planning that you could resequence the, the, the work. So I, I'm, I'm really now believing that we need to take a step back. We know we need a better planning solution. CPM is, is, is okay, but projects, like I say, they keep overrunning. I think we need to lessen the dependency on, on this linear, this linearity, this, this concept of B has to follow A. And then we could still do our execution planning, you know, our interval planning, but it's the, the starting point that that planning planning phase that we need to 
we, we, we've got to, uh, to address. Mm. We love talking to you, Dan, because you've, you've just got always the future in mind and you always challenge the conventional, even though you're well-versed in the conventional and you've made, you know, various kind of visualizations and software outputs that would, that's helped, mm -hmm. I would say thousands and thousands of planners and projects yeah. all around the world, um, which is, which is a great thing. Um, I wanted to ask one of the other methods that's at least from a visualization pers perspective and see if, if you have you accounted for that as well. You, you would probably recognize particularly maybe rail and road time change from a visualization perspective. I know it's still on based on the fact of CPM, but I did like some very simple ones, by the way, I did like some of the ideas of the vertical build process in that. I found that very, very, once I got my head around it, like I, I, I'll be honest, Dan, when I first looked at it, cause I'm not that smart, right? When I first looked at it, I was like, what, did, what the hell is this? <laughs> but from an engineering perspective, it makes total sense, right? So the engineers explained it to me and then I was like, ah, so if anyone hasn't seen it, check it out. Time change. I think it's called linear project management or it's a visualization space. We spoke to Santosh Bard about it some time back on a podcast, but is that something you're looking at as well? So you can see a smile on your face there, Dan. So, so back in the uh, mid or early nineties, I finished my undergrad in civil engineering and all my friends were going off and getting fancy jobs in London. And I had no idea what I wanted to be. So there was a, a research opportunity at uh, the university of that, that I was at to uh, pursue a PhD in uh, time change scheduling and optimization. So I'm awesome. smiling because yeah. I'm looking on my bookshelf for my uh, PhD thesis and I was gonna uh, um, open it up and, and uh, show you some concepts, but it's actually on a different bookshelf. So I'm very, very familiar with uh, time change. So, um, you know, to the layperson, I, I describe it as a two dimensional Gantt chart. A Gantt chart shows you the dimension of uh, dimension of time. Uh, time change um, shows you time in one dimension and then most commonly location in another dimension. So, you know, for a road or a linear mm. rail pipeline project, you can plot uh, not only when activities are going to happen, but where with regards to start and end. And then that typically gives you a, a, a diagonal uh, a line, uh, a vertical line uh, would show you um, work happening across multiple locations at a single point in time, a horizontal line is the converse. Now, time change actually um, came about from a, uh, a concept um, called a harmonogram. Um, and uh, the harmonogram was actually originally used to show uh, time on the horizontal and um, different uh, uh, geographical areas on the vertical. And then the intersection of the two gave you empire. So there's actually a very famous harmonogram that shows you know, very large, uh, I keep using the word chunk, but very large uh, rectangles or chunks for things like the Roman empire. Um, so it's very, very informative because it gives you the intersection of time and something else. So with mm -hmm. regards to projects, time change, um, and, and let's make sure we differentiate between time change reporting and time change scheduling. Because mm -hmm. if you take a CPM schedule and plot it on a time change diagram, that's reporting. Now, what can you do with that schedule? You can adjust the location of the activities, but as soon as you adjust the timing of the activities, you have to go and re-CPM. So, so time change is really more of a, historically, it's been more of a reporting mechanism right. than it has its own independent scheduling mechanism. Having said that, my, my concept of, of chunking work and, and hierarchically breaking down those chunks, what if you could graphically represent those in a two-dimensional type chart similar to time change, you would then mm. be able to drill down through time, through location. One of the limitations of a time change diagram is the physical uh, location of the project has to be linear. Again, it, it's road, rail, pipeline. Um, if you take more of a, a two-dimensional, maybe it's a, a, a tower block, um, time change actually doesn't lend itself to, to reporting because time mm. change projects are by, by very nature, they're, they're linear. However, the concept of time change, the two dimensional concept, the fact that you can look at clashes because if I give you a Gantt chart and there are two activities that are overlapping, you may say, well, that's a clash. And I could say, actually, no, they're in two completely different locations of the project. 
two different uh, crews, no problem whatsoever. Conversely, I could give you two activities in a Gantt chart that don't overlap and you'd say no problem. Mm. And I'd say, ah, but they're actually in the same location and the time needed for crew A to leave before crew B comes along is actually a problem. Yeah. So time change gives you, gives you these clash points. You can, you can look at the rate of work by looking at the gradient of the diagonal lines. Um, you can color code. There's all sorts of great things you can do with them. Um, where I would like us to see, where I'd like us as an industry to go is take the concept of time change, the concept of two dimensions. Let's forget the two and make it N dimensions. Because if we allow ourselves to go into the depth of the page as well, you could have cost, you could have risk, you could have yeah. mm. dimensions. Um, you wouldn't have to just be limited to, to linear A to B. Um, ditch the CPM dependency, allow the planner or the scheduler or the team to interactively move these chunks around um, to, to optimize, to sequence. You'd be able to look at clashes. Th th this concept of, of, of visual planning in this two-dimensional, multi-dimension, if you go into the page, I think is the way to go. That is so good. I didn't even know you did your PhD on this. So it was... Um... That was a great hit for me. Yes. I got a great bit of nugget of wisdom out of that. Oh, that was interesting. I mean, I've never heard anyone talk about that in such detail and passion, Dan. So thank you so much. And I think you're right. I think, I, but almost I go back to that point. I think to think two dimensionally, you actually have to have a three dimensional model um, it, because you have to have that drillability. I think you need to be able to push through the, the, the curtain, if you like, of tasks. And I love the way you described it there. Everything's so fluid when you talk, Dan. So I'm looking forward to the future. It's very bright for us. And, and it's good if, if that chunking down in the PBS as well, you know, each piece is socially aware. It, um, it socially distances and makes sure there is no clashes. You know, maybe it has some kind of awareness of itself and, and its constraints within that system mm -hmm. as well. That'd be really fantastic. Uh, and an awareness, down... of, awareness of risk, of float, of resources, of uh, physical constraints because of... of, of you know, lay down, lay down yard of materials. I mean, the, the, the number of dimensions that you could overlay in, in that type of charting is almost unlimited. And as we're chatting, I'm actually scanning through, I'm trying to bring up my 300-year-old uh, uh, harmonogram uh, uh, picture for you. So let's keep, keep chatting. Let's see if I can bring it up. Yeah, yeah, of course. Harmonogram sounds like a musical instrument. I love it. And, uh, and, and for those that are listening and jotting things down, do, I mean, plenty of information on the internet. Um, just remember the difference as well between reporting and, and actual linear project management. But um, great topics there. And I think uh, I'm going to hand over to Dale before I get stuck into another topic. No, Val, I, I love it because, you know, I think Dan's got us hugely excited and those listening as well are probably equally, if not more excited as well. But I, I love how we're starting with the present because that's where we're at and delving mm. into what could be or what should be or how things could be different and challenging that. Because spoke about first principles around WBS and how that might be sort of reimagined into something else, maybe a PBS or some other name. But you also touched, Dan, before you get the WBS, you spoke about scope. Mm -hmm. And I want to peel back that layer a little bit because often the scope is looked at perhaps at the beginning of the project. Now you've got your WBS and then you go straight into your planning and your schedule. And that those two are two different things, but you got your schedule and you never, well, not you never, but hardly ever go back and revisit the scope or revisit that WBS. Maybe through change control, you do a little bit of it, but where do you really step back? And maybe we do have some processes that have gates to do that, but really in effect, you start off life typically with ill-defined scope definition. And you're then expected to have this schedule that supports this multi-year, multi-billion pound or dollar mega project on a really ill-defined scope. So perhaps it's taking that planning concept and saying, well, let's start with the scope that is actually really well-defined and that we agree mm -hmm. with. And then as we chunk it, to borrow your term, yep. uh, we, we then chunk it into the areas where we have less maturity of scope. And as we mature that scope, we define the breakdown, whether that's work breakdown or planning breakdown or product break, whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. it is, yeah and start detail planning that. So I just wonder what your take and experience is actually is on scope, because is there then technology or solutions that will help us as project professionals deal with scope management? So I believe that projects overrun, whether you're building a garden shed or a multi-billion dollar 
uh, infrastructure project, they, they overrun because of misalignment or misunderstanding of scope between the owner and the contractor, the, the group that's building the thing. Um, you know, when, when, you, when you start a, as an owner, you typically have an idea of what the scope should be. Inevitably, that scope changes over time. And in the early phases of the project, actually before the project's a project and, and you're walking towards a handshake between the owner and the contractor or project sanction or, or uh, agreeing on price, really what you're all trying to do is sit around a table and as the owner organization, I'm saying, I want you to build this. And the contractor is trying to do their best to understand and interpret what that scope really is and come back with a price and make a little bit of a profit on that price, obviously. And if you get any of that wrong, if the, if the owner either, either under eggs or, or misrepresents what they're wanting for scope or the contractor misunderstands, you're ine inevitably gonna have a mismatch and a misalignment. And, that, and that's, why projects, that's why projects go belly up because even if the, the plan 100% accurately represents what, this, what, the, what the contractor is gonna build, if the contractor hasn't perfectly mirrored what the owner wants, then you've got a scope mismatch. Yeah. So, so we don't have today good tools for scope management. You know, that, that, that the, the line between scope, which is a deliverable and work on the scheduling side, it's so blurry, it's very gray. You know, I'm, I'm sure we're gonna get uh, CPM vendors uh, email us afterwards saying, well, you can manage scope in my scheduling tool. Yeah, 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 it, you, you've just mushed it with, with activities. It's just part of your WBS hierarchy. There needs to be a firewall between what is scope and deliverables and what is the work needed. Yep. It's almost as if you have an owner view and it, ooh, maybe you have an owner view of your hierarchy going upwards and a contractor view of the work going downwards and then you align the two. Um, on, on the concept of modeling scope, I think if we can do a better job of, of articulating and defining scope in a hierarchical manner against those scope elements, then we can start to better assign um, not just the cost, which obviously from an owner perspective, I want to know how much something's going to cost or how long it's going to take, but also the value that it's bringing to me as the owner organization, because then I can start to make informed decisions on, well, you know, I'm willing to as a house owner or someone that's building a house, I'm willing to give up my game room in return for a bigger outdoor uh, garden area because of the value is greater, things like that, right? So, so and what if we then also associated risk or, or, or tagged those scope elements with risk? Because um, today all the risk analysis that we, we do is primarily around the work. Well, yeah. again, as an owner, I think I'd rather be tuned in as to uh, which, which, which deliverables are the riskiest. You're, you're the contractor, you, you do this every day. You carry your own, you carry work risk. I, I'm, I'm trying to avoid or mitigate my, my owner risk, which is ultimately the deliverables that you're building for me. So I think there is a, a whole science around scope management um, that is quantitative scope management. This isn't just sort of the qualitative define and, and you know, write yeah. a 200 page scope document. This is coming up with a mathematical model that puts value, cost, risk, time, all of the, the attributes that we track for work. Why don't we track those for scope as well? Yeah, no, then hugely... that, and, sorry, go ahead. So, so, sorry, matey. And then that scope model becomes the framework against which we draw down the work. Yeah, no. like I was, I was, I was just thinking that those listening might go, well, isn't that 4D, 5D? modeling, planning, et cetera. But I think there's an added dimension to this um, because it is different in my mind, at least um, talking through it because for, for, for many people, I think when they talk about risk management, cost management, scheduling or planning, they're thinking different silos. They, they, they're going to different parts of their brain where actually it's all intertwined. It is. Um, and it's how we bring all of those connections together in one space, mathematically mm -hmm. and logically. And maybe it's not that logical, maybe it is that complex. Um, so, but we do have technology these days that can sort out that complexity for us. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, I'm just so, thinking out loud. I don't, yeah, I'm not sure yeah, I've got a question. Yeah. So, so I picked up on your concept of 4D modeling or, or BIM or whatever, you know, whatever the buzzword yeah. is, is today. 
again, 4D modeling, um, when you add the extra dimension, it's typically you throw a CPM schedule at, at a yeah. 3D model. You're still throwing work, worky stuff at that 3D model. As a mm. owner organization, if I've built a refinery and the refinery is now in the operational phase and I've gone through the pain of, of construction and, and commissioning and handover, I'm not really going to care about that 4D model. The work's been done. My, my, my asset has been built. What I care about are the systems within that refinery. Well, those systems, that's the scope of my asset. Um, and so over time, I'm going to want to track, again, the value, the risk, the hotspots, uh, the maintenance. I'm going to want to track that not by work that was done during construction, but by the different systems of the asset, which is all around scope. So again, you know, 4D, BIM, I, I think um, has helped us as an industry tremendously. I just think the things we're throwing at these 4D models, perhaps we shouldn't be throwing work at the 4D models, we should be throwing scope. Yeah. Ah, now someone's gonna say, well, that's great, Dan, but during construction, we are gonna want to look at work. Okay, but now that we're using this new planning technique where we start off with scope and the work hangs off the scope, I can still throw scope at the 4D model and under my scope elements, I will have the associated work elements. So you get that for free anyhow. It just means everything rolls up to deliverables and scope versus versus work. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, I love this space. Just one more before I hand back to Val. And this is where we sort of go into the impacts of COVID over the past 12, 18 months, Dan, and how that's sort of changed the way, you know, projects are being executed. I know you had some thoughts and ideas around this. And from your perspective, what are you seeing the change of execution? How would that impact how we move forward as a profession, how we potentially plan and execute going forward? Is there a massive impact? Um, well, there was certainly an impact to us doing this podcast because we got delayed by a month because uh, I, I got the Delta variant. But uh, um, relating it back to projects, Again, I think this is a great example of where the, the, the linear nature of CPM scheduling falls apart because CPM scheduling doesn't do a great job of taking into account um, procurement constraints. You know, in the last 18 months across every industry, I think without exception, you know, we've all heard of the supply chain constraints and you can't buy a piece of furniture for love nor money, or you can't get a push bike. You know, there's a 12 month delay on, on buying a, a kid's bike at the moment. So it isn't the, um, uh, the, 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 it's not my inability to go down the bike store and buy a bike. It's the fact that the bike manufacturers have this horrible supply chain constraint and they, they can't get the raw materials or the parts or in some areas, you know, there's a, a massive chip shortage and et cetera, et cetera. So I think we have, under-egged and underrepresented the precursor to execution in the execution plan. That's a bit of an oxymoron there, but, but we're, we're so hell-bent on planning the execution phase when we build a CPM schedule. You know, often, yeah, we put in some procurement activities in the middle and, and off-site fabrication stuff, but we don't really, we, we pay lip service to it. That, that fab and, and procurement phase in itself should be treated as its own as its own execution phase. By the time you get to site, within reason, if the right people are there, you've got the right materials and the weather is as, as reasonably expected, there's no reason why you shouldn't just perfectly finish on time. Well, we don't perfectly finish on time. So it, it, it's, 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 we're not taking into account the, the scope of work prior to what we think of as execution. Um, and I think we should take into account that the precursory elements such as fabrication or offsite fab or procurement are as important as the physical construction itself. Yeah, you're yeah, right. Uh, even on that and, point around procurement, you, you were going to add, Dan? Sorry. Yeah, no, well, again, it just goes back to this concept of that way then if we've taken into account procurement, and we get to the execution phase or we get to the, the field execution on site and things don't turn up as expected because of things like supply chain constraints, 
that's another perfect reason why we shouldn't force ourselves down this linear scheduling route. You know, if, 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 if there was a planning technique that allowed us to be more flexible and resequence based on the right people, the right materials, the right equipment being present, then that would give us a lot more freedom to optimize during execution. Yeah, 100%. And um, I think you're right. I mean, I've, I'm happy to say it. I've never been in an organization that's had a mature procurement plan. And I'm not talking about the sequencing. I'm talking about generally, like you said, vertically. We know as part of the scope, we're going to have to procure material and resources. Um, but when it comes to scheduling that out in line with the CPM, let's say, it's, it's never aligned. It is never aligned. Sometimes it magically appears. Sometimes there is a way to get material on site when you need it. Uh, and if it's local, obviously it's a lot easier. Logistics when it becomes uh, international, obviously, especially now during COVID is an absolute nightmare, especially if you're trying to get it through all sorts of quarantines, especially if it's um, big items or long lead items uh, where you have to put months and months and months of, of kind of lead time in to make sure that it hits that JIT, that just in time or it sh hits the shed and is available and it can be kitted out in time. It, that JIT is not really a methodology that's going to work in this post-COVID environment, surely. Again, I agree 100%. It's so interesting. Um, so I, I mentioned I've been on sabbatical for uh, the last uh, six, seven months. Um, I've actually been pr pretty busy with uh, facilitating a lot of uh, risk risk assessment workshops for, for owner organizations. And it's so interesting, you know, you, you, you interview the procurement team uh, as to uh, when they're going to um, you know, place orders for long lead items, et cetera, et cetera. And their mm -hmm. response is always, well, when does the when does the installation team need it? So they inherently are thinking, you call it just in time, I call it ALAP, ALAP planning, you know, as late as possible. Well, yeah. they're, they're thinking about it the wrong way. And that goes yeah. back to my point of, well, look, if we could procure and deliver earlier, that would give us an opportunity to accelerate and optimize in our installation or, or execution. So, and, and I think it's just inherent. I think it's just the nature of how as an industry we've planned over the last 50 years. I think if we turned it on its head and said, no, don't, don't think in terms of, don't ask the execution team when they need stuff, tell the execution team, how early could you actually deliver these, um, these dependencies, the, these, these procurement items? Because that would then actually influence the execution team and how they plan their, their execution. So it's true. And they couldn't blame procurement then. I mean, what would they do then without having that as a, as a proxy out, you know, the project manager, well, it's procurement, <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> anyone who's in procurement, love you guys. Uh, it's a hard job. Um, look, I want to get into, uh, you were talking, you just touched on risk. Um, but before we get into that, um, knowledge driven planning, you know, we talked about the you kind of almost inventing roles. And I wanted to check whether you talked about people or, or machines when you mentioned, the the scope planner and and the works planner um just touching on those those roles are they physical roles labor roles or specialist roles you're talking about or you think it's more of a modeling question and it would be a machine that could effectively work in that parameter i think it's both i mean at the end of the day a machine just responds to inputs that you give it and then it follows instructions mm. um I, I i think you know humans are very good at uh remembering historical facts, um, but we're not very good at um, mining through large quantities of data. And that's where computers are very good. So to date, um, we haven't really cracked how to take an analog piece of knowledge or information in the way that a human thinks of it and digitally store it for subsequent easy retrieval. And that's where AI is starting in the construction space, the project management space. It's starting to have a little bit of an of a impact. You know, I, I, um, uh, I think it was on the, uh, the bleeding edge, not the cutting edge of, of construction management AI about four years ago when we started the, uh, the basis tool. You know, the concept there was you feed it uh, historical project information, it then digitally stores that information. And then there was an inference engine that um, you know, emulates uh, uh, 
human thought in terms of going and, and mining through that information and coming back with suggestions. And while the concept was sound, um, you know, I think there's still a big opportunity for technical improvement. I, I'm being careful with my words here, but uh, mm. um, the computer still doesn't work as well as the human is really one. I'm, I'm trying to say in, in that environment. And I know other vendors are continuing that path today. Um, I think we've, we're probably 5% into that journey. I think there's a, a huge opportunity um, for us to, um, I don't know if it's necessarily a technology constraint today. I think we need to rethink how we articulate project information and feed it into the computer. Um, but anything we can do to, to go down the path of knowledge-driven planning, and, and knowledge-driven planning is just a fancy way of saying, look, let's not start with the blank sheet of paper every time. You know, we, 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 we've got, hundreds or thousands of years worth of construction knowledge um, you know around the world Let, let's start better leveraging that so that we're not reforecasting from scratch every time we uh, we embark on a new a new project yeah i uh you know last last podcast i had a not an aneurysm but i think i had a, a new synapsis unblocked and I realized that, it, you know, Dave Snowden was talking about the transfer and translation of knowledge. And I felt like, you know, when we do put something in written script or when we do try and architect or archetype knowledge and bank it, you know, we want a knowledge bank it. We mm -hmm. want knowledge workers, but we want a, some, some type of retrieve and recall function to improve yep. and enhance our memory, right? That's how we get through projects. But he was talking about this intacit, uh, untangible ability of, of kind of the storytelling way of passing knowledge through and you was you made an example about safety and i said that's actually how it works you know you you, you tell a story and it, and it's embedded in the mind very quickly um you know from your perspective there's there's two ways to kind of look at knowledge that's explicit and tacit how do we get that um like you said how do we increase that transfer of knowledge because we the more we obviously as you said the more we train models the more we train machines the smarter they become um i just don't know that what that transfer mechanism would be and what that would look like so I think there's multiple steps. First of all, um, it's very painful or it takes work or effort to train anything or anyone. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm helping teach my five-year-old daughter how to uh, read at the moment. And uh, mm. um, it's painful for me as a dad, it's really painful, right? <laughs> and I'm sure it's even more painful yeah. for, for her. But again, you know, if I'm a planner, a scheduler, cost estimator, the last thing I want to do is, is spend additional effort and time somehow training a computer. I want the computer to scrape that information and glean it from me in the background automatically so that that training process you know, bears no additional burden to, to me. I think on the software side of things, from a, from a software engineering perspective, we need to do a better job of determining how we store that information. Because again, you know, we, we we haven't moved that far away from the concept of a database where you have tables, each table represents an entity, each entity has attributes. And then with AI, you're trying to shoehorn this analog into, into the tables and the, uh, uh, the fields. Now I know people are gonna scream at me and say, well, we've got neural nets, which is pattern matching. And yeah, 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 that's the retrieval mechanism, but you've got to retrieve from something and mm. computers store ultimately in hex or ultimately in zero, you know, in zeros and ones. And so we, we've got to come up with a better way of modeling that knowledge. The retrieval mechanisms that are available today, whether it's neural networks or uh, knowledge-based systems, which is, is basically asking a, a series of weighted questions, whereas a neural network is, is just looking at patterns in a, in a sort of a, a blind manner, if you like. Um, the retrieval mechanisms are quite good. The, the, the means by which we store construction or project information is still very heavily dependent on old fashioned databases. Now, if you ask me what the solution is, I don't know. Um, mm. I, I just know that we, we've got to, it's, the computer has to store in a more analogous way to the way humans store the retrieval mechanisms. I think we're getting very close to emulating that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I mean, I, I actually recognize, you, you mentioned it before as well, just this data hygiene in general. Um, you know, we, we I, I kind of talk on projects about 
being data custodians. Um, I think even Jeff Bezos says, I think, you know, we're kind of the generation, he said something like, we're the generation that will um, enable AI, but we probably won't benefit from it because we're going to build the foundations, the infrastructure, the scaffolding that would allow AI to plug into something, right? And it's got to retrieve from some quality source. Uh, we've got a brain, that's our quality source, but but machines, and they are, and I have seen some changes in that space, but um, Dale, what do you think? I, yeah, I, I just think it's a massively interesting space to sort of, try and put our minds into because especially with our esteemed guest today because dan's been t- mm. at the forefront of technology for many years but one of the things i was thinking about on the risk topic dan was that i often say to people and they don't doesn't really register i don't think that risk drives schedule and they go mm-hmm. okay because usually they have a schedule and afterwards they go and do risk management yep um but then i got thinking bringing in tools, technology, AI, machine learning, whatever you want to call it, technology. And we're talking about ones and zeros. And I guess it's what we're talking about is that context and contrast that the ones and zeros don't provide when you're applying historical data to future forecasts. Will we then get to a stage where, and I think you're alluding to, we we might be close, where that context and contrast is there? Because... I, you, we know that the end plans of the world and the, the nates of the world, they're, you know, they're getting there and mm-hmm. they're certainly allowing us to make more informed decisions that, that retrieve and recall as, as both you and Val have said, but will there be a stage where actually that, that retrieve and recall is provided with context and contrast to actually then become, and I think Val, you used the phrase, rather than predictive, but prescriptive. And I know that sounds like, you know, (laughs) way in the future type stuff, but it might not be. So we actually looked at um, trying to make the the suggestion engine in our uh, AI scheduling tool basis, both context and sort of contrast aware. So to give you a simple example, you know, the idea was either planner interrogate the computer and say, how long does it take to complete uh, so many linear feet of earthworks? And the computer comes back and says, okay, well, you got to tell me the linear distance. So I say, okay, it's a hundred meters. And it comes back and says, that's four days. What we tried to, to build on top of that was context awareness such that that suggestion would have come from some historical knowledge. Well, that historical knowledge would have carried perhaps a geographical location, perhaps a month of the year that was impacted by weather. And so if it was a, say an activity that was carried out in the winter and my schedule, my plan is actually being carried out in the summer, then the computer should be smart enough to come back and and apply a bias and, and, and in this case, accelerate that historical suggestion because of the benefit of the summer. Um, The modeling and the mathematics around making those changes was super simple, dead easy. Where we really struggled was enriching the historical information in the knowledge base to contain the attribute, enough attributes for the computer to be smart enough to make those adjustments within the context of context. You know what I mean? So so, so that you needed a lot of meta information in your knowledge library around context for those adjustments to be to be useful to be effective Um, and again that just goes back to it takes an awful lot of um, decorating of of knowledge or data in your knowledge library for these tools to be useful Um, so we, we came up with a system called knowledge tagging where you could tag location uh uh, the con- subcontractor that was used as many different dimensions as you wanted. It was super flexible. But again, the problem was a human had to sit down and decorate those tags across all of your historical information. Now, if we can automate that process, then I think we're truly going down the path of um, AI. Yeah, it, 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 is, it is interesting because it, it's such an unknown space and we have these, you know, these Hollywood movies that come out and sort of, 
give us these hopes and dreams and fascinations. And Val is still in the queue um, for Elon Musk's <laughs> uh, chip in his the back of his head. Um, but I, yeah, I, I just wonder, will you know this notion of will computers ever replace humans? And I mean, especially in the in the controls or planning space. And I don't know if it ever will. There's a, obviously a big debate, and you can be on both sides of, of that argument. Um, but I think at the heart of it, it's also, I mean, Felt says I say this on every podcast, which I probably do, but you know, the very definition of a project is a unique endeavor with a definite start and definite end. And so if it's unique, how can we then take historical data and apply it today? And I think what we're saying is, well, we can't really to the, you know, the, the full degree, but what we can do is narrow it down and provide a little bit more certainty in what we're doing. Now you've touched on, you've had a few risk workshops of late. I wonder around certainty, because, okay, first off, let's just as a baseline, because we like baselines, what is risk and what is uncertainty? And then maybe you can go into what you're seeing in the, in, in, in the real world. Oh my gosh, a little bit of a risk <laughs> management theory. So um, the way I, d I describe the, the sort of the difference between uncertainty and, and risk is uncertainty is, um, again, I'm not going to use a very technical phrase here, but it's, uh, it's wiggle. It, it, it's, it's uh, let's say we have a cost or a duration forecast, um, but we are not 100% certain around the scope. We're not 100% certain around the rate of work. We're not sure how much the contractor is going to cost us per hour. There is a degree of wiggle. It could be upside, it could be downside. There is a range. That range is commonly known as uncertainty, and that gets modeled today using three-point estimates, triangular distributions, blah, 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 blah. Um, risk is typically more of a discrete, uh, it's typically an event. So it's typically an external factor on the work. So when you look at the overarching risk exposure on a project or an activity, risk exposure can be driven by varying amounts of uncertainty plus risk events. Now, as you firm up your scope and your rates, and you, perhaps you've got your, you know, your, your bids have been awarded, the degree of uncertainty reduces and ultimately diminishes. Your external factors, your risk events that have a probability of happening, and if they happen, they have an impact, those risk events still continue irrespective of your uncertainty diminishing. Um, now, that's the theory in a, in a risk workshop with, uh, with you know, 20 um, field executioners, it's actually very difficult to um, ensure that people think of those two drivers of overarching risk exposure. It's really hard for people to, to um, properly differentiate them. And again, you know, in, in prior years or prior software products that I've been involved with or, or, or invented, Computers are very, they're zero one. And so you have to, you have to model things separately. So you do model uncertainty and risk events as two separate discrete things. Then you put them in the hopper, run your analysis. I think I'm at the point now in my thought process where actually because humans struggle to truly differentiate those two, that we perhaps need a, a, a better or a newer way of modeling, modeling risk. And, and this is a bit of an indirect loop back to your comments five minutes ago, but um, you know, when, when, if I asked you about a previous project and said, hey, how long did that project take? And you said 24 months, inevitably, you're going to say 24 months, but da, 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 da. But we got held up by COVID, but yeah. we had extreme weather events, but the contractor went bust. There's that but is providing context as to why your project took what it took. Well, what if, when the computer makes suggestions, whether it's from a risk analysis or AI suggestions or, or even just simple scheduling, computers, they're good at coming back with a, a finite answer. You, know, you give it a calculation, it comes back with 27. Okay, but what happens if it came back with 27 and said 27, but on this particular project, these factors were the most impacting to that 27 months then the computer's starting to respond like a human. When I facilitate a risk workshop, someone will say, yeah, it'll take 27 days to do something, or it took 27 days to do this on the last project, but we ran into uh, uh, certain constraints. We ran into permitting issues. 
ah, so now you're giving context that 27 months was perhaps longer than usual. Typically it would take 22 months. So now you're starting to home in on what the most likely value should be. And, and humans are inherently brilliant at, at providing the but. Computers are inherently rubbish because they, they aren't quite at the point yet where they can, they can also um, mine associated context and provide that context back with the answer. Yeah. Did, no, did that, that make sense? No, it, it did. It did. And I am processing, processing still because it is late at night in the UK. But um, no, I, <laughs> I, 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 I follow. I just want to, before I hand back to Val, just touch as well back on the human side and the, and the professional that might be using or interacting with the technology that might be in the future. And then particularly because we are educated and we go through the likes of your, you know, your APMs and your PMIs, et cetera. Are they moving with the times to equip our project professionals to be able to use this type of technology? We're seeing in the UK um, that you've got, you know, your data science apprenticeship, the Martin Pavers of the world, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if it's fantastic if we're moving this way in terms of the technology, but will we have the people that will actually be able to use it to its full capability? Or do we need the people to be capable to be able to use it? Will technology be able to stand on its own and give us the answers without any further education on what it's actually telling us? So, so technology cannot stand on its own two feet without humans embracing it. There's no point having technology unless it's utilized by a human. Um, so with that, within the project management space, I strongly believe that we as practitioners need to embrace technology. And really, I think what I mean is embrace change. You know, we're, we're all professionals within this industry. We're all um, proud of our historical achievements, but that doesn't mean to say that we should be skeptical of what is coming down the pipe. Now, Everything coming down the pipe, is it gonna work and be great? No, you know, that there's, there's a lot of interesting hype right now about the, um, the half steering wheel on the new Tesla model. Um, you know, it's basically a steering wheel cut in half and you hold your hands on the bottom of the wheel instead of the top of the wheel. Um, is that concept gonna stick? I'm not sure, but it's <laughs> one of many that are coming from the organization and it's okay to, to be a little different and, and and, tr and within reason, try things out. Um, if, if our track record for, for CapEx projects was sound, there probably wouldn't be a need for new, better stuff. But I've been in this industry quarter of a century and our track record is rubbish. It's absolutely terrible. Yeah. <laughs> so that isn't to say we've done good stuff. We have done good stuff, but we can do better. And so I think, you know, you mentioned uh, AAC, I think you mentioned PMI and uh, APM and uh, uh, Martin's group, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, without getting into the politics of all of those groups, I think sure. as with any group, you're going to have laggards and you're going to have uh, people that embrace um, change. I think having people that challenge change for the sake of change is very healthy, but at the same time, We've got to have a, a, a population that is willing to give um, new concepts um, the chance to, to succeed or potentially fail. Um, mm. And I think, you know, I look at other industries outside of project management um, and perhaps we're not the most forward thinking, uh, cutting edge industry okay that's all right that's an opportunity for us to, to improve on that mm. um mm. you know and let, let's leverage some of the other industries whether it's you know, navigation or or you know any of the, 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 you know, the manufacturing design, manufacturing let's let's yeah. it's okay to uh um you know uh, innovate is to make better invent is to create and it's really hard to create especially in 2021 because most mm. things have been created However, there's still a huge amount of scope for improvement everywhere. And so let's look at it as let's, let's innovate within our industry by looking at what other industries have done and how they've solved problems. And that innovation then is, is obviously a good thing. 
Dan, it's always good talking to you. Uh, I love futurists such as yourself. I feel like, you know, we could go on for hours. Um, I actually wanted to really, on that point around people and professions and institutes, I actually think what we need in uncertainty is discipline. The thing is, is everybody can self-serve and everybody can self-educate. You have the most powerful network of computers in the history of mankind at your fingertips on your phone. And what we're seeing from some of these other institutes, Dan, as you know, they're giving education away for free. Google, IBM, mm -hmm. Harvard Business School, they're giving away data science courses, AI courses, machine learning courses. I, I often put people in the right direction and sorry for any institutes that are offended, but the institutes will change because they're a membership body they will change once they see what the members are doing. So if the members start moving away, it changes the membership model. If we're not being innovative and we're not pushing the boundaries of our craft, then the memberships will stay the same. And I think because they are paywalls, a lot of these are revenue-based companies or certification-based organizations. And I, I get frustrated when I see two-day courses, three-day courses, someone gets a certificate, puts it on LinkedIn, and then all of a sudden, their CV is now the most desirable. Well, why is that? It's not factual. And I think just from an education perspective, I think guys go out there and explore, as you said, Dan, other industries. What are they doing in, you know, even in the, the silicon space, what are they doing with, with electric cars and, and these self-driving mechanism? What's, what's behind it? Get curious about it and see how much of that you can apply back to your day-to-day. -day. And I think that's a really important thing. I think what a lot of project professionals don't have is a hobby, Dan, you know, it, it's good. To, it's good to study. It's good to study things that are necessarily in your perspective or in your uh, peripheral. You know, I do, I do basketball coaching, Dan, and I actually learn a lot about basketball and I apply that to my real world life. It's important to have things that are kind of nonlinear and not part of your, 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 your profession to give you different ideas and, and perspective. You, you're laughing, I know. Um, well, I'm laughing, just, I'm just chuckling about your comment about uh, um, project management professionals and uh, hobbies. So for the record, I actually, uh, um, I do have a couple of hobbies outside of uh, my, my passion again. for, um, well, I actually uh, uh, collect and curate uh, antique uh, computers and cryptography machines. So um, no way. very, very old uh, machines. Um, so uh, I hunt them down and then um, uh, try and bring them back to life, which, you know, you would think is a very uh, logical, linear sort of, well, you know, just fix this and it'll work type of thing. But there's a huge amount of... Uh, trial and error in, in the curating and, and restoring of these old machines. So uh, that's awesome. That's awesome, Dan. We yeah, didn't know that about yeah. you. Now everyone knows that's fantastic. I think that's great. It's, it's historical too, to do that. There'll be a Dan museum. I wonder one day where we can see the history of computers and crypto cryptocrats. Um, exactly. Look, I, I know we haven't got a lot of time, Dan, and I know we've got, we've got to talk about the next thing. What's the next big thing from your perspective? I mean, we can go all over the shop with this, but we were, we were originally talking about critical path method and we know that that's not the only option out there. And we kind of broke that down uh, for the, for the listeners. Um, but what's, what's coming next? What can we expect? Gosh, again, so big question. So I think we'd be foolish if, if we, um, well, I think I would be foolish to stand up and say the next big thing is X. Yeah. Um, I, I think instead, the next big thing is the combination of multiple incremental steps. Um, I do, having said that, and those incremental steps include things like you know, uh, improvements through AI and the computer making suggestions and, and some of the things we've talked about. I do think we are long overdue for a big upheaval in CPM being the underlying um, framework, if you like, for, for scheduling and forecasting. And again, do I have the perfect answer? No. Um, I would be you know, really excited if, 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 if as, a, you know, as, a, as an industry, we could formulate a bit of a think tank. I've got some fairly well baked ideas. You know, I shared with you my, uh, my chunk theory. Mm. Um, and, 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 you know, that's one of several. I just, I, I just keep coming back to you know, it's almost like we've we've got to the point where we've taken the combustion engine and we, we've pushed it to the point where we've made it at the, to, as about efficient as we can. 
Um, however, we need to now look at alternate uh, engine sources, you know, whether it's electrical or, or whatever it is. And I, I'm just drawing an analogy with, with cars. Obviously, I'm talking about you know alternate scheduling means. Um, I, I think it would be very healthy for us as an industry to really focus on alternate, better, um, a better framework and, and um, basis for the building uh, forecast. I think, you know, back to the incremental gains, I think uh, and we've touched on this. I think we touched on this in a, in a previous podcast, but um, I think the science of risk management is a little long in the in the tooth or the, the, the implementation of, of the software tools. Um, you know, we're still, we touched on it earlier, we're still, you know, requiring team members to think in terms of computers, three-point estimates, triangular distributions, uniform distributions. No one, no one gives a hoot what they are, but no one even understands really what they are. Very few understand what that is. You know, these practitioners, they can articulate very well and they're absolute experts in uh, field execution and you know, they have years of historical experience. Well, let them articulate that experience in the way that they naturally uh, think and, and explain and articulate. And let's make the computer smarter at, at, at absorbing that versus forcing the human to think, okay, you're asking me to explain a forecast as a minimum, most likely maximum duration. There's this complicated translation. We, we need to get away from that. The computer behind the scenes can still model using that, but the human doesn't need to be exposed to that. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask, yeah. were you there? I'm oh, sorry to interrupt your, your flow. Uh -huh. um, is, there, is there any products that you're working on right now that you wanted to let the listeners in or, or we come back to you in a, in a couple of months? Um, if you get everybody to sign an NDA, I'll uh, I'll, I'll uh, share with you my uh, my PowerPoint pitch. But uh, yeah. how about you give me a few more months to uh, to um, continue down my uh, so-called sabbatical, and then I would be super excited and honoured to share with you the concept. And I tell you what, you you guys can then have the opportunity to uh, to to completely shoot it down if. Uh, if you think it, if it doesn't have legs. Ah, come on. No, we would love to be exclusive <laughs> with you, Dan. We would love to launch it and help you promote anything that's kind of bringing the future to the to the present. I think it's important to be excited and optimistic. And so it's great to have people like yourself, Dan, who are still passionate um, and COVID hasn't perturbed you at all, even on your sabbatical, you're working, which is fantastic. So Dan, uh, thanks. Thanks for being here, mate. Dale, over to you, mate. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, Dan, I love when you go on sabbatical because I think you've got a track record. Every time you go on sabbatical, boom, something new comes out. So watch the space, folks. But we, we are short on time and we do have to make some time for our feature. And when you joined us on the last podcast, Dan, we hadn't brought in these two features. The first one, a bit of fun. Well, they're both fun. But the first one, bit of fun, defend the indefensible. It's inspired by ridiculous statements that we hear every day. And so what we do is we throw a ridiculous statement at our guest and we invite our guest to defend it for 30 seconds. So, Oh, no, really? <laughs> bit of fun. Only 30 seconds. Ah, you'll be fine. Okay. You up for so that? You want, me to def you want me to defend whatever you're going to uh, read to out? State. Yeah, absolutely. So you've got to argue for it, right? You ready? I don't know. <laughs> it's pretty easy. Here goes, right? We don't need new project management technology. All of this data we have is only academic anyway. Okay, run the sentence by me one more time. We don't need new project management technology. All of this data we have is only academic anyway. So if I am a owner, my goodness, I mean, what a, what a ridiculous statement. You want me to defend it? So. <laughs> I don't care about the scope of my project and, and money is no object, then I absolutely stand behind that statement. But as we know, very few organizations are either that stupid or have that much freedom. I'm not sure I like this game. <laughs> uh, that, that is the whole point. It's just a bit of fun, Dan. And um, yeah, I, we have had quite a few that actually just went the other way and we're like, can't defend that. Just 
Yeah, ridiculous, but yeah. it is a bit of fun. Well, let's move on to the next one. It's called Fiverr. Oh, you've got another one? Another game or yeah. another undefendable? Uh... No, not, not, not uh, a defender indefensible. This is just a quick pop quiz all about yourself. Um, so oh five quick okay. fire questions all about you. Really easy. So if you're ready. I'm a very, I'm a very private guy, but okay. Let's go for it. <laughs> uh, question one. Would you rather spend your day with people or technology? Oh my gosh, people in a high tech environment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Question two <laughs> What's most important, time, cost, or quality? In context of a project or life, or. This is the fun about it. It's whatever you. Whatever okay, context actually, my you answer, want. Actually, my, my, my answer. So I think the answer is the same irrespective of context. I, I don't think there is a unique winning element. I think it, it, uh, there's weightings to each of those. I think in life, what's really interesting is the weighting of those elements changes over time. And I think the same is probably true with projects. You may start off a project being very time sensitive and then for various reasons you know, over the life of that project, uh, the quality or the, the, the cost or the value of that project becomes more important. Amazing. Think, uh, weight, weighted attributes that absolutely change over time. Amazing. Two guests in a row where there's so much thought put into that question. We've had a lot of guests that just go time, cost, quality, but I love that you put a lot of thought into that one, Dan. Question three, what is the best book you've been gifted? My goodness, the best book that I've been gifted. I'm drawing a little bit of a blank. Um, that's okay. We can gift you a book a, if you want. A, well, I have a bookcase full of uh, project management books, which have been highly uh, influential to me. You know what? The best book, I'm not sure if it was gifted to me or not. There was a, uh, a publication by a guy called Steve Krug. The book was called Don't Make Me Think, and it was uh, published in the early days of dot-com. And it was all about uh, human user interface in software products. And it was at a time, uh, the uh, you know, early web applications, it was the wild west, there were no uh, UX, UI standards. And, you know, as a, an engineer, I came into developing software thinking, well, the more buttons, the better, right? It's gonna make us look clever, we'll charge more money, blah, 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 blah. And the, the don't make me think book actually turned that on its head um, and, and, and absolutely changed how I think of user experiences in a software product um, to the point now where we actually strive for a minimum number of clicks, buttons, uh, page refreshes, et cetera. Um, so that, that's, that's been a highly influential uh, uh, book. Now, I think I bought it at Barnes & Noble. I'm not sure it was gifted, but... Uh, <laughs> Well, except there's no rules to this this pop quiz, Dan. Yeah. It's whatever answer uh -huh. you want to give us. 100%. Exactly. Uh, question four. What is the biggest mistake you've made on a project? The biggest mistake I've made on a project is probably one of my own projects. So about 10 years ago, my wife and I bought a, a two-story house. The uh, first story had been completed. The Second story was effectively a, an unfinished attic. And um, you know, being the, the seasoned uh, project management professional, um, I took it upon myself with the, with the contractor to uh, manage literally everything. I, I micromanaged the poor guy. And um, I focused on micromanaging him and his team. And I think we probably doubled the, the duration of that project and the cost to my wife and I, not because of crappy execution by those guys, but because we didn't define the scope up front. Um, I mean, we, we, we moved layouts, we, we changed the staircase, we did all sorts of, we were basically designing 
and scoping on the fly. So uh, there you go. That goes back to our uh, discussion a few, uh, mm. or 60 minutes oh. ago around nail the scope and then worry about the work. I, I focused 100% on the work instead of uh, taking a step back and properly defining the scope. Lessons learned indeed. Question five. If you could choose to spend a day with anyone, past or present, who would it be and why? Outside of the people that I get to spend time Anyone. with today, I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. You know, if it was my last last day on Earth, then uh, obviously I would be with my uh, my wife and my daughter. If if I had the luxury of pushing a button and uh, anyone on on planet Earth from any uh, time period could could you know magically appear on in my uh, living room, um, gosh. I think I'd have to say John Lennon. I think uh, oh, wow. oh, um, love, love, love his music. Um, no, that's not true. Love, love, love his lyrics. Um, I think um, he had a massive impact on society beyond uh, music. I think the fact that you know his his songs still resonate and are relevant and and uh, still make sense, you know, you know, decades later is is very telling of. Uh, um, the impact that he had to us and and um i mean shit who wouldn't want to sit sit down with john lennon and uh shoot the breeze so yeah i think that's an amazing person to spend a day with and why not but thank you so much for your time dan again it's been an absolute pleasure and privilege yeah. to have you and we'll, we'll we'll take you up on that offer when you're ready we'll get you back to unveil and you know with i don't know how much we'll be shooting it down but it'll probably be something amazing so watch the space folks but then before we let you go any final thoughts you want to leave our listeners with um i don't know if it's a, a thought but just really a, a thank you you know this is the second time uh you guys have invited me to uh to appear on the podcast and you know i'm as I think you can probably tell, I love project management. It's all I've ever done. Um, I'm a one trick pony. It, it's, it's my thing. Um, but you guys really challenge. I really like the way you, uh, uh, you, you diplomatically uh, ask the questions and prod and um, yeah, have thoroughly enjoyed it. Other than the, uh, uh, the five questions at the end, they, 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 they were a bit out of my comfort zone, but uh, the project management stuff I loved. So I well, we love what you guys are doing. No, thank you. We did cut them down. They used to be 10. Um, so we, we did cut them down to five. There we go. But no, it's, you know, it, it, it's our absolute pr pleasure to have you. Val, any final thoughts from you? No, no. Thank you, Dan, for being on the show. I think uh, we are looking forward to the future and it's great to have an optimistic outcome for construction projects. Again, everyone who's doing it hard out there, just, just hang in there um, and, and keep listening. Absolutely. So folks, that is all the time we have. Uh, but remember to hit subscribe before you go. Once again, a massive thank you to our guest, Dr. Dan Patterson, and thank you all for listening. Till next time, we say stay safe, be disruptive, and have fun doing it. From me and Val, it's bye for now.